All right, welcome to CS uh, 4510. The topic of today, uh, this is LO9B, I think. The topic of today is something called Turing completeness. This is a theory that has been perhaps you may have some internet level understanding of what something means to be Turing complete. But I think the internet is pretty wrong about a lot of this. So today we're going to give a very formal, uh, with the church Turing thesis, a very formal definition of what these things mean. Um, so we talked about the church Turing thesis last two uh, half lectures. We talked about Turing's argument that everything that is fathomable can be computed by a Turing machine. And we also tried and failed to give several generalizations of the definition of a Turing machine because each generalization ended up being just only as powerful as it. So again, the church Turing thesis says, uh, for any fathomable computational model, decision procedure, set of rules, whatever, uh, C fathomable implies that if, even if C can't be fit in such a way, whatever language C decides can be um, uh, decided by a Turing machine. The Turing machine, in some sense, is the ultimate uh, computer. Yet the Turing machine is quite simple. So anything that a Turing machine can do, we said, is, is can capture the intuitive notion of what a human can compute, the, the, the informal definition of computation. Um, we get an analogous uh, theorem. We say uh, C is Turing complete if uh, L of C, excuse me, L of TM is a subset of L of C. Why? Composition, Turing machine, really big, huge, powerful class. If you can simulate a Turing machine on something, then great, that thing is powerful. You don't need to prove, usually when you prove equality, Turing completeness, we want to define a model of computation to be Turing complete if it's equivalent to a Turing machine. But it's sufficient for us to simply do the set containment one way. Why is that? We already know that it's fathomable, so it must be. Yeah, if C is passes the fathomability criteria, then obviously you get the reverse implication for free. So to prove something is Turing complete, you don't need to do a double set containment. You simply need to prove this. If you assume the church Turing thesis to be true, and you better, you need to only do the simulation one way. Right? Um, this is the what we'll take as a definition for something to be Turing complete. Any questions on this yet? OK. Python is Turing complete. What's the proof? I would only ask you an easy question, yeah? Yeah, what you could do is let L P pi be the class of languages decidable by, by Python. I can write a Turing machine simulator in Python. I'm not going to. I could Google it. It would probably come up on GitHub. So QED, anything that a Turing machine can do, a Python program exists to do the same tasks. Therefore, Python is Turing complete. We know, again, by the Church Turing thesis, a Python has all these crazy built-in libraries, all these instructions, whatever. It doesn't matter, because we know that the reverse is true, simply because Python is fathomable. Two sentences, quickly. Python, when we mean Python as a computational model, we're not referring to a real programming language. A programming language is a specification that a real computer must simulate. When we are referring to a programming language in this way, we're talking about the mental model of, of a programming language, which is that as if you were thinking of Python as an automata. When you read code and you kind of simulate it in your brain on an input, like what would happen? Oh, I divide by this, so I'm going to add this, and then you know, I'm going to sort this and whatever. Right? That's sort of what we mean by Python, the mental, the mental model. Um, you can write a Turing machine simulator in Python. So sufficient. You can do much more in Python, I'm sure. But it turns out you can't do much more. So uh, Python is Turing complete. Questions on that? Yeah? Is anything we're going to talk about, like, since it's a mental model, we can like, use it infinitely, right? So we don't we'll talk about the infinite tape part and the infiniteness of it uh, later today. This is the second half of today. There will be a resolving answer for you. Um, Second comment we can make, nothing about this proof was Python specific. I didn't even write any code. 
So you can replace Python with your favorite Turing complete programming language. When a, pro when a programming language advertises that it's Turing complete, they're not really saying much because they're really saying that you can simulate a Turing machine on it. Um, OK, I mean, that's all we really need. Uh, not every programming language is Turing complete, though. And you would be hard pressed to find some that aren't. But some are not Turing complete on purpose because they want some certain features. Um, I think Bitcoin uses a stack-based language to guarantee that there's no infinite loops you could sneak in there. Uh, there's some other contrived examples you may be able to find or think of. But most of the useful examples, any, any language that you can think of uh, is Turing complete, any useful language. We immediately get another application of the Church-Turing thesis is that language that when you choose to do some computer science, you go to write an algorithm in, in a language, you go do some implement, implementation work, it doesn't really matter the language you choose. When you choose a certain language over another, you only go by features. You never, ever made that choice by power. You know, If I describe to you a high-level algorithm and I ask you to go implement it in your favorite language, it doesn't actually matter what language you can choose because they're all Turing complete. All the reasonable ones are Turing complete. You never, I've never explained like a sorting algorithm to someone and said, well, this can't be done in Java, but it can be done in Python, something like this. That's something that we take for granted, but it's actually true by a corollary of the church Turing thesis. right? When you choose a language for a certain task, you choose it by its features, its standard library. Oh, this is safe. Oh, I don't know. I have the, the library for this one, the, the framework, whatever. Not the actual code, right? Uh, not the actual power. They're all the same. You can, one can simulate another. Questions on that? Right. Funny story. Actually, I can say uh, Ethereum used to advertise that it was um, Turing complete. But they didn't really understand what that meant. And it was one of the few languages I could, you could think of that actually is not Turing complete. Uh, so dangerous weapon, often misstated, but this is a formal definition of it, an unarguable one. Right? OK? Uh, what about the four computational models we gave? We gave state TM. We gave the two-way TM. We gave the K-tape TM. And we gave the um, NTM. All of these are Turing complete. Why? There's a generalization to the Turing machine. Exactly. For each of these, we defined them explicitly to be generalizations. The Church Turing thesis gives us the reverse implication. But because you can simulate a Turing machine on all of those computational models, they're Turing complete. We didn't even need the we we last time we spent a lot of time on the reverse of the set containment because that was the simulation evidence in favor of the Church Turing thesis. Now we take the Church Turing thesis as truth, and the simulation uh, this is all we need for it to be equivalent, right? Not a term of Turing machines are Turing complete, almost obviously, right? Questions on this one? All right, let's talk about grammars. We remember everything about grammars. A regular grammar uh, had rules that look like this. A single non-terminal goes to either a terminal, non-terminal, a non-terminal, a terminal, or the empty string. So it was like A goes to AA, something like this, right? Those were the only rules that were allowed. A context-free grammar had rules that go like a single non-terminal gets replaced by a string of terminals and non-terminals. So this was like A goes to B, C, D, E, whatever, right? Something like this. Uh, a context-sensitive grammar is you have A, V, B goes to A, V, union, sigma star, B. Uh, for A, B, fixed uh, elements of uh, V, union, sigma star, right? And this went like, you know, A, A goes to A, A, something like this. That was the context-sensitive grammar. Um, we may define something called an unrestricted grammar. An unrestricted grammar is not a universal grammar. Universal grammar is Chomsky's theory of the mind, whatever. An unrestricted grammar is basically, let's forget any restrictions on the rules of productions. We'll define it. an unrestricted grammar basically as a substring replacement system, which is as general as possible. So v union sigma star 
The only reason we don't define the left to be any sequence of terminals and non-terminals is we want to end productions at some point. So we'll add, in fact, one restriction, that the, the left-hand side must still contain a non-terminal. This is the way we'll enforce that uh, the string terminates when it has no, excuse me, the computation, the production terminates when it's out of uh, non-terminals. Otherwise, you would have terminals replacing itself perhaps off too much. So we'll enforce that there is uh, one terminal on the left-hand side. And this goes to any string of terminals and non-terminals. Right? Yes? Any string coming before, this is a regular expression that corresponds to any string of terminals and non-terminals with at least one non-terminal. Oh, it's not a union, it's a union. Oh, yes. Yes, okay. Um, right, that's an unrestricted grammar. Obviously, unrestricted grammars are really powerful. They're more powerful than context-sensitive grammars because every context-sensitive grammar is an unrestricted grammar. But how much more powerful do we think unrestricted grammars are? Turns out that the unrestricted grammars are Turing complete. We can actually simulate a Turing machine on an unrestricted grammar. Kind of crazy. A Turing machine, again, is an automata. It's a computation device. It, it moves state to state. An unrestricted grammar is a producing device. It only produces strings. Yet we can create a set of rules to simulate any Turing machine. That's kind of crazy uh, from a step back. But actually, if you take a step forward, it's not that crazy. Consider a Turing machine that looks like, uh, let's see. Let's say we do the bit flip Turing machine again. Okay, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to read a 0, write a 1, move right, read a 1, write a 0, write a 0, move right. Consider the sequence of configurations of this machine, okay? Let's start the machine on uh, the string 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay? The next configuration of this machine is going to read a 0, excuse me, read a 1, write a 0, and move right. The next configuration of this machine is going to read a 1, write a 0, move right. Eventually, it's going to read all the zeros, right? something like this. Notice, though, as the sequence of configurations change, a local part of the tape is the only thing that changes. Only near the tape head. did the computation change. The rest of the string remains unchanged. What we're going to do is simply write a unrestricted grammar to simulate the way the configurations change. One configuration to another is simply a string rewriting of the previous. We literally took a substring of it and rewrote it. That's one configuration to another. That's how we're going to define an unrestricted grammar to do the same. It's going to simply simulate the Turing machine's configuration changes. Questions on that? This relies, importantly, on the fact that computation is local. One step to one step, you change only a constant amount of, of the tape at once, right? So if we have, for example, let's suppose our Turing machine has states q0 to like qk, and even like qa and qr, or even q halt, whatever. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, create a set of non-terminals v b, s, and we'll even add a, b, and then we'll add q0, the q, a, uh, q, r, right? And of course, q, k, right? So we add a set of non-terminals for each state. Immediately, you may see parallels to what we did for the regular grammar simulation by an NFA. It's almost the same, but not at all. Um, so if we have some rule like read an a, write a b, uh, we'll say it this way. If we have some rule, read a C, write a C prime, and move right, 
from QI to, excuse me, from QI to QJ. What we may say is the configuration changes in the following way. It goes from A, B, Q, I, C, D. This configuration yields A, B, C prime, Q, Q, J, D. Did you agree? Read the C, write the C prime, and move right. Go from Q, I to Q, J. What we're going to do is simply add productions that simulate this. Q, I, C is going to go to C prime, Q, J. Read a C, write a C prime, move right. That works. Do we, any questions on that? Do we see why it works? It simply rewrites a small substring. That's all it is. What if we have C prime, receive write C prime, move left from QI to QJ? This is going to be like uh, we're going to go A, B, Q, I, C, D. This is going to yield, read the C, write the C prime, move right. So this is going to be A, Q, J, B, C prime, D, right? A little trick here because this B now is moving in front of it. We've, we have like a sort of asymmetrical way we have to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to like say, okay, we, Q, I, C. We want to go to uh, read the, write the C prime and then move uh, to the left. So it's going to be like Q, J, something C prime, right? But what's that something? We simply have to make one production for each possible thing that we see. So if it's A, C, A, Q, I, C, we do Q, J, A, C. If it's B, Q, I, C, we go, do Q, J, B, C. And if it's like blank, Q, I, C, we go to Q, J, blank, C, C prime, excuse me. Left move correctly simulated, right move correctly simulated. Any questions on this? We've definitely simulated the intermediary steps, but we don't have the setup yet. Do we agree that this at least correctly simulates the intermediary steps of the Turing machine? OK, here's how the setup is going to work. What we're going to do is have the non-terminal B produce for us an unlimited amount of blanks, an arbitrary amount of blanks, excuse me. We'll have the non-terminal A produce for us sigma star. And then we'll have the start go to Q0, A, B. Okay? Q0 is the start configuration. The start configuration is always Q0, W1, Wn, right? So we just put Q0 there. A is going to be W1 to Wn, whatever the input is. We'll just non-deterministically produce all possible inputs. We produce that as A. And then we produce any number of blanks we may need for the computation, right? Given our example, again, of the, of the machine that loops, writes, and bit flips, let's try to see what that would look like if we were to write the production out. We would have S goes to Q0 A, B, goes to Q0 uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and let's say 1 blank, right? Then this is going to go to, we'll have the rule Q1, read a 1, uh, write is 0 and move right. So this is going to look like a 0, Q, Q0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, blank, right? You can see it's exactly the same configuration. Actually, there's one step we're missing, which is acceptance. We want to stop when there's no more non-terminal, so we'll define QA goes to the empty string. That's the only way you'll remove a, a, a non-terminal. All the other rules, remove one non-terminal, add one non-terminal, so it's conserved. Great. This is sufficient for us to prove that uh, any language decidable by a Turing machine, there exists a universal grammar to produce the same language. Right? Notice that even though the, Turing, even though the definition of an, a universal grammar allows it to be non-deterministic, uh, this grammar is kind of deterministic. The only productions that are allowed are the deterministic ones. So the only time that non-determinism occurs is when choosing the string at the beginning. All the other times, determinism is occurred. And in fact, you could even simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine easily on a universal grammar. So the non-determinism of the grammar will simulate the non-determinism of the Turing machine, right? Questions on this? Do we believe it? Are we encoding, like, because 
in this case, we're not, like the Turing machine itself isn't necessarily making a decision. It's performing a computation. And so like in that case, the framework that we've used for like a language kind of is unsatisfactory in some way. Like you would define a language to be like the set of things that are accepted or rejected. But in this case, like we also care about the input in some sense. So let's do, let's try to do both ways. The Turing machine, a language accepted that an automata accepts or decides, DFA, NFA, PDA, whatever, is its behavior and infinitely many inputs. The language that a DFA accepts is, the languages that, the strings it accepts are those that it accepts. So the, looking at the whole language, you're looking at its behavior and infinitely many inputs. Here, the grammars, all production devices, don't begin on inputs. They simply have to exactly and only produce the strings that they should accept. So what we want to do here is, how do we determine that a, a string is produced by this grammar if it has no non-terminals? So in some sense, excuse me, in some sense, all possible working strings will exist somehow through this, but the only working strings that will become strings that we would say that string is then ex produced by the grammar is if there are no non-terminals in it, and that is guaranteed by that rule. Yeah, but like the Turing machine, the important part of the Turing machine for this particular problem is not just the fact that it produces one 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 one, but it specifically produces one 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 when you give it zero 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 zero. Or like vice versa. That would be a computation, yeah, a, com a computing Turing machine. I claim with a little different setup you could do the same thing, nice. but if we're concerned with the dis uh, with the decision framework with respect to languages, again these are not computing anything is, is, except to reject the decision problem variant of the thing. It works out. I think you could do the computing variant kind of easily. But almost uselessly so, because some Turing machines, uh, you could think that a Turing machine that computes, if you think about what it accepts, it's just sigma star. It's not helpful to think about that, right? You, you can define, um, right, something like this. But if you consider the machine has to start on all possible inputs, it would just be f of sigma star. And if the machine halts on all possible inputs, it's just f of sigma star. So that's kind of sigma star, right? Not too useful. Questions on this? A little bit of baggage in the uh, edge cases. But the important part, of course, is the takeaway. The takeaway is the one step of the machine is simulated by one step of the grammar. Yeah, questions? CSG looks really close to this, so is there like a more strict version of Turing machines that CSG is equivalent to? Absolutely. In fact, CSGs are exactly restricted because a CSG has a fixed A and B at the beginning. Then um, a CSG corresponds to two definitions. One is what's called a linear bound automaton. A linear bound automaton is one that has exactly O of n space. Every algorithm that is O of n space, it can be done by a linear bound automaton. CSGs is just actually like surprisingly useful, real, big category, like practically for algorithms. Most algorithms use less than linear space. We haven't talked about a way to measure space, but suppose you don't use more tape than the input. A linear bound auto automaton literally looks like this, okay? It's got its input there, and it's, it has exactly as much input as, it has exactly as much tape as the length of the input, and it can iterate over it. Oh, it has O of n amount of tape. That's exactly what the um, context-sensitive grammars produce. In fact, a modification of this proof for context-sensitive grammars is exactly how you prove that. Yeah. Um, yes. So they're not Turing complete, though. We they're only not Turing complete if you if you can believe that there exist languages that are not done in linear space. Turns out there are. We'll prove that later. Right. Questions on this so far? Let me give you the picture. Um, what our hierarchy looks like so far. So we proved that the language is decidable by uh, DFAs are a strict subset of those decidable by PDAs. And now we know these are a strict subset of those decidable by uh, Turing machines. Well, do we know that? Why is every context-free language Turing decidable? We 
can fathom them, right? If uh, a CSG is equivalent to, or sorry, an unrestricted grammar is equivalent to uh, a Turing machine, and all more restricted uh, grammars can be created from an unrestricted grammar, then it follows that. Yeah. Why is it strictly so, though? We, there's a language you can compute with a Turing machine, which cannot be done by, uh, so uh, just cannot be done by a PDA or a grammar. So it's contained in, and then we have one example, so it's not so it's strict, right? If we were to characterize the class of languages decided by types of grammars, we have the regular grammars, which correspond to the DFAs. Then we have the context-free grammars, which correspond to the PDAs. And then we have this little intermediary class, which is actually not that big or important. It's the LCSG, right? And then we have uh, unrestricted grammars, right? The CSGs are not that big, it turns out. Um, why is there no bigger class besides the unrestricted grammars? If we're only concerning ourselves with, with production devices of string rewriting rules, why is there no greater class than the unrestricted grammars? Because the unrestricted grammar is equivalent to the Turing machine, and we know that any fathom problem can be solved by a Turing machine, and so there cannot be any. Yeah. The Church Turing thesis gives you the picture for grammar devices as well. That's, the, that's it. That's the whole picture. You know, there's nothing, nothing exists out here for the same reason there's nothing more powerful than a Turing machine. There is no more powerful string rewriting system than an unrestricted grammar. Right. Kind of perhaps obvious simply because an unrestricted grammar is extremely general. I mean, it's called an unrestricted grammar, right? Can you think of a generalization of an unrestricted grammar? I don't know if I can think of one. I can think of restrictions of an unrestricted grammar, but it's just a general string rewriting system, right? It's just so general. Um, all right, any questions on unrestricted grammars? All right, let's get on to the, the next part, which is a PDA with two stacks. So consider you got a PDA with two stacks. Um, Say it's A, B, C, D, E, F. And then you can push and pop to them simultaneously. Uh, I gave you a question on the homework to prove WW is decidable by this uh, weird device. Um, I claim that a PDA with two stacks, we, that proof, you, prove, you should prove that a PDA with two stacks is strictly more powerful than a PDA with one stack because you can simulate a PDA with one stack on a PDA with two stacks. Right? So we'll call this LPDA. We can prove that every language decidable by a PDA can be accepted by a PDA with two stacks. Right. Furthermore, you can argue that these two classes are not equal because your homework is to put WW on the two PDA. But the two PDA, uh, but WW cannot be done by a PDA. We pumped it. Right. It's composition of many long theorems. We have to do PDAs equal CFGs. We pump CFGs. WW is not context free. Um, how powerful is the 2PDA then? I claim that the 2PDA is Turing complete. We'll simulate a Turing machine on a 2PDA. Crazy that two stacks is enough to decide every language. How does the proof work? Just like put them next to each other and just like perpetually cycle through. Proof by picture. We're going to simulate a tape on two stacks like that. There we go. Let's denote that one as a tape head, right? QED. Uh, sort of obvious in that sense. The limitation of a one stack PDA is that, like, when you pop things off, if you need to read arbitrarily deep into the stack, you are forced to lose information. It's gone into the ether. The second stack solves that problem because everything that you would lose into the ether, you just push it to the second stack, and now you don't forget anything ever. That ends up being just a Turing machine. Um, right. Let's talk about how the, how the uh, simulation may work. Let's suppose you, uh, let's suppose we define the instructions as like pop one, pop two, push one, push two. Right? Something like this. 
Uh, and then, of course, the, and actually, the PDA is slightly more technical because it has an auxiliary structure with just the input that it can only read. That's read only, left move only. Let's ignore that. Let's just suppose we pushed the input to one stack first, right? Suppose we set it up in a certain way. If we want to simulate a read A, write B move and move right, what we would do is on a two stack PDA, we would have this as pop nothing off the first stack, pop A off the second stack, and push B to this, the first stack, right? So the way this would look, read A, pop A, push A. So that's read A, write B, move right. The move right is sim symbolically done by popping off the stack. All of the right stack is now slightly more forward to you. You push into the left stack. All the left stack is slightly farther away from you. Right. Similarly, if you wanted to do um, Read A, read A, write B, uh, move left. You would do uh, read and you would pop the A. Oh, this one's a little tricky. You would pop the A. Um, push the B to the left stack. And then you would pop whatever U was on the right stack. And then push that U to the left stack. Something like this, right? What does that end up? What does that end up looking like? Um, I'll put it over here. Something like that, right? Read a, write the b, then you pop the u and push the u. Slightly imbalanced again, but that's just the nature of our configurations. Questions on the two PDA? Like a hierarchy of uh, string rewriting systems, grammars, production systems, we also get a hierarchy of devices with stacks. Um, consider a PDA with no stacks. Uh, a PDA with no stacks is what? NFA. That's just an NFA. Uh, what about a PDA with one stack? So what is that? That's just the PDA, right? So, uh, and then we have now the two stack PDA. Okay. Obviously, unlike the unrestricted grammar situation, you can just keep giving a PDA more stacks, right? What do we think we know about the PDA with three stacks? Completely unfathomable. <laughs> Completely unfathomable. Um, no, wrong. The, the PDA with three stacks, in fact, uh, can be simulated on the PDA with two stacks by the Church-Turing thesis. Since the, PDA, the two PDA is Turing complete, this third stack doesn't really matter. This implies, in theory, without knowing what the simulation is, uh, someone gives you a specification of a program that uses three stacks, you should be able to write that in two stacks. Is it worse time complexity-wise or whatever? Probably. But anything that can be done with three stacks can be done with two. Crazy to think about, but I don't think I've ever seen a program use more than two stacks. Maybe this is why. How would this work? You would convert the three PDA to two PDA by first simulating the three PDA on a Turing machine. Then you would convert the Turing machine's read, write, and moves to the two stack PDA we did there before. So in fact, no more than two stacks is, uh, is incredulous. Two stacks is sufficient. You have two stacks, it's over. I mean, you've, you've, you've hit Turing completeness. One more comment I want to make is that actually in the history of computing and developing these tools, the PDA is very non-trivial. It's very easy to accidentally define a system to be Turing complete. Anyone can come up with a system and, oh, it, I, it's so simple. You don't need much for a system to be Turing complete. It's just accidentally Turing complete for anything you could probably come up with. The PDA was interesting at the time because it was an example of something that was definitely not Turing complete. It was very contrived. Although we presented this class in such a way as like, oh, look, we did DFAs, we did NFAs, we did Turing machines. The PDA is actually pretty unique in that regard. Turing completeness is pretty low bar to achieve. 
uh, in terms of automata you can create. PD, uh, DFAs as well, right? Um, we have one more model of computation to consider before we talk about, uh, but any more questions on PDAs, two PDAs? Uh, consider a finite tape Turing machine. A finite tape Turing machine looks as follows. It has an input. We need to contrive it a little bit. It has an input, which is read only, uh, write move only. And then it has an auxiliary tape, which has only a couple cells on it, like finitely many, it's like four cells, OK? Consider a PD, uh, excuse me, a Turing machine M with its input, but then it has finite tape, right? The machine, we define it this way the, with the input separate, so it's not bound on the, length of the strings it can read based on the uh, size of the tape it has. Let's say if it only has three cells, it should, a DFA can still correctly decide arbitrarily long words, right? We want to give the, the Turing machine the same advantage here. But it has an auxiliary tape of just three or four cells, okay? K cells. What do we think the power is of the finite tape Turing machine? DFA, probably. It's regular. Why? Because you could just make, like, the, like, you could, for every single possible string you could have on the finite, like, thing, you could just make an entire copy of the Turing machine, or, like, of, the, of like, the states. The configuration. The configuration. Then you can simulate that part on a DFA because you're only moving right. Yeah. So configurations, a configuration of this machine encodes the following pieces of information, right? It's the state, it's the tape, and it's not even the tape that with the with the input on it. That's not part of the configuration. It can't do it. Can't, it that can't be part of the configuration. It's only the work tape. We'll call this the work tape. There's one other thing. It's the tape head, the uh, the tape contents, and the tape head, and the tape head position. All right. Um, Notice immediately for the contrast between the Turing machine, how many possible states are there? There's Q. How many possible tape contents are there? I suppose there's K cells. How many possible tapes are there? Language to the K. Language? Or however many characters are in the language. Yeah. So it's going to be gamma to the K. How many possible tape head positions are there? Yeah. So that's a number. That's finitely many numbers. So there's finitely many configurations. Make a DFA of each configuration and wire it up appropriately. QED. There's a second proof of this, which you, you simulate a K tape, a K space machine on a K minus one space machine by doubling the number of states and using one less cell. You perhaps could figure that out. But there's only finally many configurations of a K tape machine. So just make one state of the machine per configuration and then just wire them up according to the transition function. Right? The accepting states of the DFA would be the ones that contain an accepting configuration, where Q is an accepting state here. Right? Any questions on this one? A little more hand wavy here, but see if we got lost. So the, we see that the finite, the finite tape Turing machine is regular. It can't do anything more powerful than a regular language can. It can't do anything more than basic pattern matching, more than a DFA can. But the proof is actually hides a kind of a, an important detail. There's a huge misunderstanding on the internet that I'm going to rant about, which is that everyone argues, a lot of people argue, that um, no language, no programming language is Turing complete. Here's basically how the argument goes. C has a register size. It can only address 64, it is 64 bits, it can address a register. It can only address 2 to the 64 possible registers. It can, it's a machine with 2 to the 64 possible tape cells. 
uh, it's not Turing complete. It's a finite tape Turing machine. Can't do anything more than this. It's kind of a problem with this in several ways. Uh, first is that it's incredible. It's incredibly stupid to say that like C is not Turing complete as a language. It doesn't capture the notion of Turing completeness. All these arguments rely on the fact that every computer has a finite number of addressable cells of RAM. Most people have 16 gigs of RAM. If you have a Mac, you have like eight gigs. You know, so it doesn't really matter though, right? No one has ever said, oh, I'm running a DFA. That doesn't really, that doesn't really matter. Um, then there's another thing people say, well, you know, the, the amount of information that we can see and observe in the universe is finite at any moment. So uh, no, Turing, no computer that could be built ever is Turing complete. The infinite nature of the tape is very essential to Turing completeness, as we see here, because the finite tape doesn't work. But there's a detail missing from both of those things. First off, is that the Turing machine is not actually infinite in its use of the tape. It just has an infinite tape sitting there waiting. The configurations of, there's finitely many configurations of the finite tape Turing machine, but consider the same argument for a normal Turing machine, okay? Each configuration is finite in description, but there are infinitely many possible configurations, right? Uh, the Turing machine does not actually use the infinite nature of the tape in any way because each co configuration is finite. At, after k steps, you can use it in most k cells of the tape. You can't, you, there's about, there's instantaneously only finite amount of tape has been used. Even though our, you take the limit, it may be infinite, right? So what you may do is you may, and Alan Turing argues, argues in the beginning, he never says there's like an infinite amount of tape. He says that there's, Basically, if you run out of tape, if you run out of paper, you can get up and go get more. You can imagine a computer running out of hard drive space, and, it's, and it issues an instruction to the, the guy sitting at the desk, and he says, OK, go plug in a new hard drive. You know? it's, imagine that you can always go get up and plug in a new hard drive. And then you argue, well, if the amount of matter in the universe is finite, then you can't really do this because you would build you too many hard drives in the world, and you run out, right? Something like this. Um, so it doesn't really matter that the machine is finite in the amount of space it has because it never really plays with this limit in a regular way. It always stays below it, right? A second thing to note is that this is sort of an exponential blow up. A DFA may simulate a Turing machine with an exponential cost, finite still, but an exponential cost to the number of states it has to use, right? This is also impractical, because you don't ever encode. Um, you can't ever, like, it, it makes no sense to build a DFA for any program you use in, in the same sense. You don't have access to exponential amount of any resource. The, the Turing machine, I forget what I was saying. Anyway, the, the C is still Turing complete, independent of the fact that it has Every computer that you could run a C program on has finite RAM, independent of the fact the amount of matter that we may achieve on Earth is finite. These assumptions are not made. You can suppose you were to draw a picture of a Turing machine that instead of having infinite tape going off in one direction, there's a small machine here that gives you a new tape cell every time you want it. Uh, and then you push a button on the machine. So no one would argue that that is infinite if the machine has infinitely many. Uh, you could push the button arbitrarily many times. It's different than having an infinitely looking tape. No one argues that the PDA stack is infinite, right? It's the same, it's basically the same argument. But we observe basically a, a, a characterization of what something means to be Turing complete. Are there any questions on that? Right? So we may give some characterizations of what, uh, uh, basically what, what, sh what is shared by all Turing complete systems? Uh, and what makes computation such a universal topic, right? So there's some unbounded environment. Uh, such as nature or the tape or, you know, whatever your working string is. Uh, and it's operated on by small uh, local changes. 
The Turing machine is simply a, a list of ways to modify the tape. You have some large, unbounded, natural environment. It's huge. It's, it's, it's nature in some sense. And a Turing complete system is one that modifies the natural system according to local changes. The Turing machine changes one cell at a time. Same thing for grammars or whatever. They change a constant number of cells at a time. Computation, very importantly, is local. Right? There's, there is no operation that can flip all the bits on the tape simultaneously or something like this. Um, uh, even given this, uh, a program description is, are of finite length. The, ter the rules are finite. A uh, constant work is done in unit time. If you want to make uh, more and more changes, if you are only apply, allowed to apply small local changes, you want to make some large change, you must do it in a sequence of steps, a sequence of local changes. Um, infinitely many configurations. but each finite in description. So there are infinitely many configurations of a Turing machine, because you can construct a Turing machine that loops infinitely and writes one. But each configuration adds some instant. You pause the machine, you examine it, it's finite in description. That's important for the Turing machine. Technically, even a PDA satisfies this definition, right? Um, there's some concept of universality. Uh, a Turing machine, we said yesterday that there exists a universal Turing machine, U, which takes as input M, uh, and a word W, and outputs a, uh, and outputs M on W, right? This is a machine that takes on two strings and simulates one on the other. So M is some machine, uh, it takes, M. M in brackets is the code of a machine, W is some word. This is a universal machine. It has on its tape the code of M and a word W, and it'll go read the transition function of M. It'll go over here or write something on its tape. It'll read the transition function of M, go over here, write something on its tape. And it does so to simulate whatever M does. So if M accepts, you will accept. If M rejects, you will reject. If M loops, M, you will loop, right? And such a universal computer really only exists for the Turing machine, for Turing complete models of computation. I claim such a universal computer does not exist for the PDA, for the DFA. There is no DFA that takes in a DFA description and outputs yes, right? Turing machines have this ability because of the most powerful computational model that they can simulate each other. One Turing machine may simulate each another Turing machine and then do something different, or maybe it does the same thing. They can ask questions about each other in some sense. This is really important, it turns out, and this is what the remaining of the class on Turing machines will rely on. You know, Turing machines are such an important computational model. Every lecture since here is on Turing machines. It's everything is about Turing machines, right? Um, and I guess the final constraint is something we may call determinacy, determinacy, which is basically our fathomability criterion. Is like given a configuration of the machine, the local changes uniquely determine what the next uh, instantaneous description of the of the environment ought to be. It's going to be um, uh, uniquely determined by the previous configuration, right? It's deterministic in some sense. This allows, these kind of conditions are sort of not really formal, and they're sort of vibes based on when something is or isn't Turing complete, but it allows a lot of contrived systems to be Turing complete. You guys heard of Conway's Game of Life? Yeah, Conway's game of life is you have an infinite 2D grid, and each grid is uh, a 0 or 1. It pops in or out of existence as a function of the grids next to each other that pop in and out of existence. If there's too many cells that are close together, the, there's a population death. If there's uh, too few cells, there's a population death. There's like a Goldilocks condition here. You can actually simulate a Turing machine in uh, Conway's game of life. But that may not be so surprising because the universe of Conway's Game of Life, it, it's an unbounded board in both directions. It's the same thing as a tape. 
or, or, or an environment, right? Okay, any questions on Turing completeness systems? A surprising amount of things are Turing complete. A surprising amount of board game rules. I think uh, Magic the Gathering technically is Turing complete. There's a proof of this on the internet. A lot of little puzzles and things end up being Turing complete, sort of an accident. You, uh, it doesn't take much, it turns out. Yes? Does the universal machine exist using church, church, church Turing thesis, right? What yes. If you don't want to accept the thesis. Could you like you, there is an explicit construction of it as well. It's just too complicated. It's got a lot of states. The way it works, again, M is the code written on the tape. U is the code written on, is, is a word written on the tape. It uses somewhere right most of the tape, like 10 cells away. What it'll do is it'll read the tra transition function of M. It'll walk over there. It'll like make the small change. It'll come back here, read the transition function again, go over there, make the small change. And it'll just, it'll simulate it correctly, right? You can write, actually, you can construct what M actually is. Excuse me, you can construct what U actually is, right? Uh, but it exists by the church string thesis as well. Great part of the church string thesis, I get to avoid programming. Certainly, I can fathom an algorithm for something and have to not have to worry about it. See how I was like, oh, I can write, I can walk over there, read the transition, and come back. That's not a Turing machine description, but it's an intuitive algorithm. So I can formalize that as a Turing machine without any effort. Very powerful stuff. More final questions? All right. See you guys on Thursday. <laughs>